Good morning, everybody. This is Jeff Edwards and Jeremiah Vardaman and Jenny Thompson for uh, Barnyards and Backyards Live today. And uh, glad to be here, glad to bring you this program. Our guest this morning is Jenny Ingwersen Neiman. Glad to have you with us. She is the equine specialist for the University of Wyoming and uh, 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 Department of A Animal Sciences. Good morning, Jenny. How are you today? Oh, good morning. Good. Thank you for having me. I, I really enjoyed our, our last session here too, so I'm looking forward to this. Yes. Yep. Our topic today, and and we kind of started before the show, visiting the irony of how the we chose this topic way back in December, and how vaccines are everywhere on every news filter possible, right? So, but today we are going to talk about horses. So I'll share my screen. And as we go along, please don't be afraid to use the chat or just speak up, whichever you're more comfortable with and um, happy to accommodate questions as we go. The show is kind of for you. So I have a very basic introduction here for horse vaccines. Again, I'm the horse specialist here on campus. I do teaching and extension and my eyes do go back and forth here. I, I have two screens, so. We'll, we'll try not to consider that a distraction. <laughs> I know, it does feel a little distracting. <laughs> So we're just going to start talking about vaccines, like why do we give them and when do we typically give them? Again, the irony is just so yeah. much right now. I, um, we are trying to give vaccines to our horses to prevent disease. And the purpose is that we're going to prime the immune system with some type of low level or small amount of the pathogen. And hopefully we have an immune response and well, an antibody response to that pathogen. So Jenny, is everything I'm hearing mostly, at least for me, everything I'm hearing in the media, through discussion, whatever, especially with the COVID vaccine or other vaccines, right? Is that discussion gonna relate to this discussion as well in terms of the concepts of how that vaccine is delivered, the efficacy of that vaccine? Is that gonna be similar to equines or is there some completely different with equine vaccines? They're very similar. And there's, well, kind of, I actually purposely included three of the common types of vaccines here later on. Um, but I am not ever going to say I'm a immune specialist, right? A vaccine specialist for humans, right? We leave that up to them. Um, but the, the concepts are the same across mammalian species, right? That we're boosting the immune system with a smaller dose of a pathogen so that when they do encounter that pathogen, they're able to fight it off and not succumb to the illness. Or even as kind of the next line I was talking about is they may not, that disease itself, like maybe influenza, may not be fatal to the horse, but they may have some side effects or other issues that are complications due to the disease. And if we have proper immunization, then the body can fight off that infection. With horses, we typically um, give our vaccines in the spring. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about like, is it, and this is very relevant to the COVID vaccine, um, are we gonna give one as a booster or are we going to have to give a two series? So having records on your horse is very important. And if you purchased a horse trying to obtain those records, also very important. And we do typically give them in the spring a lot of our diseases that we're going to be vaccinating against in the horse are, let's say, parasite or mosquito driven. So typically, if we can give them in the spring before we have a large surge of our mosquito population, that can help also. That's kind of the timing of why we do it. So trying to cover that vaccine at the same time of activity of mosquitoes. That's rough. I just saw a mosquito last week, Jenny. <laughs> It, it actually was trapped in my truck. I think he got in right when I shut the door <laughs> and was and was really excited because my truck was definitely warmer than the outside air. I know it is really hard, especially when we talk about spring, right? Because I'm in, I'm located in Laramie here and we are awaiting the snowpocalypse here, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it is spring. We've already seen some activity of insects. But we have kind of the false spring. I always like to call it false spring, right? Warm, cold, warm, cold. We have a couple of false springs. So um, typically around March or April 
is when we're going to consider spring for our booster, booster vaccines. Okay. And we want to be familiar with the vaccine that you're using. Like, do you need the booster in, you know, the one on the news right now, Pfizer is 21 days, Moderna, Moderna is 28 days, and Johnson & Johnson for COVID is only one vaccine. So knowing, especially with foals or any horse that has the first time vaccine, following the label, the directions of when are you supposed to give the second shot. And they are typically, the second dose is typically four to six weeks later across the board. But read those labels on that vaccine yep. or, or call your vet. And that's kind of my next slide here is I encourage everybody to work with your local veterinarian because kind of regions are different and the needs of your horse are very different. Um, we're going to talk about core vaccines here first. And these are addressed by the Oh, American Veterinary Medical Association and AAEP, American Association of Equine Practitioners. You see their logo here at the top. These are considered core vaccines regardless of what your horse's level use housing is. Core vaccines to help booster or help um, keep them safe and help keep them healthy across the board. So these are, when you mean core vaccines, you're saying vaccines that should be given pretty much to any horse no matter the situation uh, or use or, or where you live. It's kind of the baseline vaccination program. Is that what you mean? Yep. Okay. Then you can further customize, like our veterinarians are gonna say all horses should have the core vaccine. And then they are the Eastern and Western Equine Encephalomyelitis, EEE -E -E, or WEE, -E, you see them abbreviated, tetanus, West Nile virus, and rabies. And the next slide, we have a little bit of detail. I'm not going to go into, oh, kind of the parasite life cycles um, of the disease themselves, but what is it? What causes it? And how do we help, how do we help prevent it with our vaccines? They're going to categorize other vaccines as being risk-based. So do you need them or not according to the activity of your horse? Or I'm going to put classification, as you kind of see down at the bottom here, too. Um, like brood mares would be a different classification of a horse and a breeding stallion or a foal or what kind of use or activity you're doing with them as we see throughout. So Jenny, are these uh, vaccinations, are they, are they annual? Are they once in a lifetime? Are they, how, how do you determine um, frequency, I guess? Tip typically every foal, right? So every foal gets a two dose series to start off their immune system. Just like COVID is a novel vaccine, novel disease for us, COVID-19, I should say. Um, so everybody who's getting a vaccine, it's all, I should say almost everybody, right? It depends on your science behind the vaccine. They're designed to be a two booster series from Moderna and Pfizer. And then Johnson Johnson's only a one booster series. Sure. Um, most every equine vaccine that I know of to start initial immunity on that full or even on a horse you bought from a sale barn and you have no idea what the history is, right? That we give them a two dose series. We give them their first shot. The foal about four to six months old, follow the label again, there's some variation. And then we follow up four to six weeks later for the second one. Okay. Then when they're a yearling, the next year, the next spring, just one dose as a booster. Okay. So after they've already been vaccinated prior, you only need one booster shot annually. Is that correct? Yep, for the most part. Okay. You can, you may have some need for a horse that's immunocompromised. That's kind of a catch-22 there though. Like you may need a booster a little bit more often if they're under a lot of stress and you're hauling them, let's say to a rodeo every weekend or um, just kind of high stress, high exposure environments. Mm -hmm. Your veterinarian might suggest maybe a six-month booster. Now, or a booster before they go somewhere, but they're they're still going to need a booster. Oh, like two to four weeks before they go somewhere, in order to have time for the antibodies to kind of redevelop and establish themselves again. Great. And so, uh, are those vaccination scheduling and frequency, would that be the same as if I lived in the Midwest or on the East Coast or anything that way? Is it fairly uniform or does that 
that of the geography is does that change that vaccination schedule at all or frequency of those i would i would think along with it we're going to say typically spring is still going to be because the animal is still going to have some immunity until the next booster oh, okay so they're still going to say spring maybe your spring is in march or february and you do your boosters in february and march or later on, March or April, or April or May, kind of for the cooler weather seasons, as long as they've had a two-dose series, they're gonna have protection. And then the protection, uh, the research shows our protection and how long the antibodies are active for our immune response according to your vaccine. So the annual booster is to kind of boost it every year. Gotcha. So it's a little different than wormers, right? So I, if I, remember correctly, wormers kind of have that three month to six month coverage. And so you might have to do it twice a year, especially if you're down in Florida or where they have the longer growing seasons. But, but our vaccines are an annual booster. You just need the one. Yep. And, and again, we're going to be veterinarian on like brood mares are going to be different, right? They need a booster 30 days before they fall. Um, those horses that are traveling a lot and have high exposure to other horses, they may say that you need a booster oh, before an event or in the middle of the summer to help with their immunity again or fall, kind of working with your veterinarian. And the dewormers, that one's a hard one too. I like, I like that topic because I got an email this morning about somebody trying to put weight on a horse and the dewormers are really, they're really tough, right? We're seeing parasite resistance. I'll try not to get too much into that side topic, but we've seen more parasite resistance with um, two our dewormers. And obvi obviously when, when there's not a hard frost, the parasite continues to live longer and you will have to monitor the anim animal more. And we're leaning more and more towards fecal test to actually identify what parasite is there in the parasite load. So then we can adequately treat them. Right. Well, and so like a year like this one, we've been so mild, it's been so warm, even through the winter time. So we, that's a possibility. Great. So what's our next consideration for vaccinations? When we look at kind of a risk base, so we have the core ones and then a risk base. So working with your veterinarian again, like influenza or leptospirosis or rhinopneumonitis, um, uh, Potomac horse fever is going to be something regional, mainly in the south that you'll see. Um, and most of these, you'll kind of get some whether you, whether you really plan on it or not, because they're sold in, next slide, we'll talk about combination vaccines, right? A five-way or a six-way or a seven-way. And, and influenza is very often um, put in with our e, uh, the EEE and WEE, right? And West Nile virus. West Nile virus has typically been on its own as a separate vaccine, but with recent technology and and kind of research, it is combined now. You can buy it as a combo vaccine with another one. Um, I'm jumping ahead of myself some more. We'll switch over. Sure. Um, so working with the combination ones, there are some advantages in that you only have to stick the horse once. And if you've, you've had a horse that really hates vaccines. Yeah, I was gonna say my mare, yeah, that's her. She, she does not like needles. And so a one, one jab kind of thing is a positive for her. So I, I kind of started talking here just a little bit about these core vaccines and, and what they are and kind of some, maybe some of the signs of them without getting into too much detail. Um, we see the Eastern and Western equine encephalomyelitis, um, sleeping sickness. It's commonly called sleeping sickness a lot. And it is kind of, this is ironic. I think the geo, geographic distribution is quite large here, right? Eastern, Southeastern, Southern, and some Midwestern states. Yeah, isn't that, it's kind of ironic. It's, it's yeah. a really big location, geographic location. Yeah, um, but it's not these, for the Western states then? They haven't put it in there technically as the geographic, but they're still gonna recommend that we do it. We can't. You know, mosquitoes don't say, I'm not going to cross that line. <laughs> they should, but they don't. They don't. They don't respect boundaries very good. You don't behave that way. <laughs> well, and then on top of it, we're, I, at least from my perspective, I'd like to get yours, but I think our, our equine populations are fairly transient. 
right? So we're moving a lot of horses back and forth for various reasons, especially the performance horse realm. Um, and so if a horse bring, brings that disease in and our mosquitoes locally pick that up and, and distribute it, is, is that a possibility as well? Yes, and if you think about, I think about Laramie a lot, right? The vesicular stomatitis was a oh, last summer, a really big concern. And if we think about, oh, students here, right? This University of Wyoming, we have a lot of students from different areas, whether it's California or New York or, you know, coast to coast or Midwest. And then they go to a boarding facility in town here. And let's say there's 40 to 50 horses in one place. And there's probably four to five of those bigger boarding facilities here, right in town. And then let's say one group of kids is our rodeo students and they travel all over and they bring their horses back, right? And then the same with equestrian team or ranch horse team or just trail riding. You can get out and explore and, and move things around just with the horse transportation or, or movements. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's, so it's, even though our, the, they don't have the Western states in that specific disease, it's still recommended for our area. Yep. They were going to say like core vaccine, regardless of geography anywhere, because it's such a, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty wow. severe disease. And we do have okay. variability on the fat fatality rate here, 50 to 90%. That's a pretty big variation, right? And I kind of keep coming back to a lot with our uh, vaccines. They're relatively inexpensive and they're kind of a cheap insurance, right? Or a cheap safeguard for your horse. I'm trying to think of five way or seven way or something around there. They're typically between 20 to $30. Yeah, Ooh. that's pretty, pretty reasonable when you're talking thousands of dollars for a horse. Yeah. Thousands of dollars for a horse and a possible vet bill if they have a neurological symptom that they have to treat. Like we actually had a guest speaker yesterday from Iowa State University, guest speaker in Zoom. Pandemic is bad, but it has opened our eyes in lots of different ways, right? And she talked about just having a horse into the vet and having intensive care for it, maybe some kind of surgery and intensive care for it. It's nothing, nothing for them to walk out with a seven thousand dollar bill. Oh. Wow. So, so Jenny, um, I don't know, it, when we're talking a five-way or a seven-way or a three-way vaccination, it, it's, it contains multiple, we're going after multiple types of potential diseases, right? So it's not just one type of uh, injection for one disease. We're trying to cover all bases. The combination vaccines do just that. Okay. You can purchase them individually. Um, usually, I'm kind of jumping ahead. There's usually they're kind of a cost benefit when they're lumped together. In the, kind of the cost, I said would be if you went to the local farm store, or ranch store, and and bought a bottle for yourself. That's kind of the cost you would see. Um, there's some variation, right? Depending if you have a veterinarian. Sure. Administer your vaccines. But typically, if you buy the combo vaccines, they're a little less expensive than to buy individual vaccines per disease. Makes sense. So on West Nile, Jenny, I see you have it there on the slide. And um, I had heard, I, I want to say it was a few years back, maybe three, four years back, that West Nile is kind of slumping a little bit in terms of prevalence in the area. Is that true? And, and if it is true, um, is that because maybe we're vaccinating or having a better vaccination regimen for it? I, to my knowledge, I still hear it's pretty prevalent. Maybe I haven't heard of a big slump sig significantly in our area. Um, there's a newer kind of research article they put out to relate horse vaccines upcoming with the spring along with COVID, right? And that the similarity is still the same with herd immunity. And I think that's kind of what Jeremiah is starting down. The more we vaccinate against it, it can be helpful, right? In eliminating or decreasing. I, I hate to even say eliminate, right? But decrease the prevalence of it. Right, yeah, we're probably not gonna eradicate the disease through immunization, but we'll, we will significantly mitigate it to where it's not prevalent in the area, as long as you're vaccinated. Yeah, 
Great. What about rabies? So now is rabies uh, one of those vaccines I need to think about every year? Do I need to think every two or three years? Is that a standard one that's in the combination? And I'm sorry if I'm jumping ahead on you. Nope, no nope, good. Because typically they have to be administered by a veterinarian. You cannot purchase rabies over the counter. They are controlled through the veterinarians and licensing the animals that um, have received a vaccination for rabies. And we see a difference in our smaller animals, like your dog or your cat, you can get a two or three year vaccine. But with our larger, larger animals, to my knowledge, we don't have a vaccine that does that due to the immune system's different in a larger animal versus a smaller animal. So doing, a, and they push rabies so much because it's, it's fatal. Once an animal's diagnosed with it, right? It's fatal. So, and the prevalence has, you know, kind of gone up and down and up and down in, in regions and areas. So again, another, another cheap safety guard. If they do happen to get it, you're gonna complete loss for that animal. Great, okay. And then tetanus, is that one, <clears throat> is that the same then? Or is that just, if that horse is cut, I need to give it a tetanus? And there's, I didn't put too much information. There's, there's gonna be two types of kind of your vac vet, uh, uh, vaccines for tetanus. I'm gonna say it wrong though, I'm going tet tetanus toxoid. One is a fast acting immediate coverage and one is a long-term coverage. So again, working with your veterinarian and making sure your horse is up to date and that they have the appropriate tetanus vaccine, one that is immediately acting and then one that is boosted every year. Gotcha. Now is tetanus usually found in the combos? Is, I think that's what you were gonna talk next, is that right? Some of them, yeah, quite a few, quite a few of them I've seen do have tetanus included. Oh, okay. Great. So maybe let's move on to our next slide, if, unless there's something else you wanted to highlight there. I just, this is, I like to be very conversational, so this is great. I appreciate you guys doing that. <laughs> and along with our chats or whatever else our audience, audience would like to participate. Um, some of our commonly seen vaccines, again, are going to be those combination vaccines that are available on the market. Um, they're commonly given as IM, intramuscular injection. And I have a couple slides of areas to give them, good IM areas to give them. And they have a high concentration of muscle here, right? So I always think of this even with kids, like, oh, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old and they get a lot of combo vaccines. And they're so small, their arms are small. They don't get shots in their arms like we do. They put them in their legs because they have more muscle in their thigh muscle. So these areas of the horse are gonna have more muscle that we'll get to a little bit later for IM injections. Um, again, the five way, seven way, four way, making sure that you're knowledgeable and that you read the label, right? And keep, keep that label with you or keep a copy, like the veterinarian um, who administers vaccines can give you, uh, you know, your receipt with a copy and a list of all the vaccines on there. Um, one thing to be cautious about when you are buying, if you buy them yourself with vaccines would be that they're stored properly. I've seen several areas where you go into the farm store to go buy your vaccine and the fridge is open or it accidentally broke and it's not working and they're not cooled anymore. Um, shipping them too, that your container when it arrives, if you happen to buy them on an online source and get them, that, that they arrive and they're cool and that you properly store them also, according to, typically they're all refrigerated. So kind of around maybe a 41 degree Fahrenheit or, or a little bit cooler, 30, 38 degrees, somewhere in there is kind of ideal temperatures. Yep, just kind of your typical refrigeration so they don't freeze and they don't get too warm either on the opposite side. Gotcha. And uh, for us, well, for me personally, I, I take it just as a safety precaution, but uh, our vaccine, we try and put it, we have young kids in the house, right? Uh, I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old and uh, they. I was informed the other day that my two-year-old's big enough to do it all herself. 
And so, uh, but we have to keep the vaccines. We try and keep all of our livestock vaccines on a higher shelf or, or in one uh, like the cheese or butter drawer that's at the top on the, on the door, just as a safety precaution, especially if they're stored in needles. Um, we just don't want it for me personally. And I'd like your perception on that, um, Jenny, but just don't want it stored technically with our food. Right? Don't want an accidental poke with the needle and the vaccine on a food source that we're going to then consume later. Yeah, and that's ironic. Mine's on the top shelf in the butter drawer also. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's just the vaccine drawer, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Butter yeah. equals vaccine. <laughs> yeah. Well, and some people, I, you know, if I'm not a very large facility, right? I have three head of horses in the backyard kind of idea. Uh, but some places actually have a refrigerator in the barn and and that's where all vaccines are stored and it's not stored with with human consumed food and that's probably the best storage if possible yep especially in our larger operations as you're saying you know my large operation of one horse right now <laughs> but you'll see in most they'll have it and they'll have a lock on the fridge a lot of the times in a bigger operation they'll have a lock on the fridge also Gotcha. Especially like at our vets, yeah. right? They're storing a lot of vaccine, a lot of, a lot of drugs. They'll lock that. Yep. But if you ever in question, I believe the, the storage of the vials or of the vaccine is on the label, correct? So you can read what is the proper storage method for those. Exactly. Yep. And I now, like your, your comment about the packaging too. A lot of the time our packaging does have the syringe and the needle with it. And that's kind of my next one of the things to talk about is being sure that that's sterile, like they're packaged sterile, they're sealed, and that they stay that way. We want to reduce the chance of introducing any kind of foreign bacteria or foreign body with our administration of the vaccine. Um, cleaning the area with some rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol prior to injecting it is good, right? And can help decrease a chance of any kind of infection from the injection itself. Now, if I just buy the little vial, like what's pictured here on your slide up there in the top right corner, mm -hmm. and I purchase my own needles and syringes to pull off of that, is there something I need to look for in that, right? Is there a certain gauge of needle or, or length of needle or anything I need to consider or think about that to be giving a, a proper intramuscular injection? I would have to go back and look at the exact gauge and what they typically use. I don't know off the top of my head because I've, I've really gotten into the habit. They're always with it. Um, you can, one thing, be cautious with like a new needle for every horse and that we're not taking one syringe, pulling our vaccine up, vaccinating the horse and putting it back in the bottle, right? Some contamination can happen there. So every time you're putting a needle in the bottle that it's a brand new one, and you should be using a different needle for every horse so that we don't, we reduce our chances of contamination and cross-contamination specifically. Great, I, I guess just from my perception and I don't know the gauge either off the top of my head, but usually intermuscular needles are fairly small in terms of length is what I'm thinking. Um, they're not a very large, robust needle, um, but that's just from my observation. I'm very much like you. I get usually I get my vaccinations already drawn for me in the syringe, so. I'm sitting here thinking 12 to 14 keeps jumping to my, I may be misspeaking, but a 12 to 14 gauge keeps jumping to the. Um, but another great question for your local vet, so. Yep. Great. Uh, there's, there is some variation in our vaccines. Most of them are given IM more of a systemic coverage than an intranasal vaccine. Um, Intral nasal. I'm, I'm not familiar with that one. Can you elaborate on that one? It will be, you will use a needle to pull the vaccine out of the bottle, but then you take the needle off and you put a little plastic tube, long plastic tube on the, on the end of the syringe, and then it's placed in the horse's nose and you put the hmm. vaccine up the horse's nose. I'm pretty sure my horse would not care for that one either. <laughs> It's kind of finicky, but just a speculation. I hope I don't have to do that one. <laughs> they have, well, it makes me think of human medicine with children. 
some oh, cool. yeah. some of the some flu vaccines now are nasal are available as a nasal vaccine for children. So can I find any of those like five ways, seven ways? Can they come in a nasal or an MI? Can do you have that discretion or is there certain vaccinations that are specifically a nasal? In the that the vaccine is going to match the administration by kind of what system it protects. If it's uh, systemic, as we talked about, I am. But the example would be strangles. Strangles is commonly available as a nasal vaccine, also as I am. And the efficacy is a little higher in the nasal vaccine because it's a local administration for a respiratory disease such as strangles. Gotcha. So it's putting that vaccine right into the lungs, essentially, where that disease is going to most likely happen. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and make sure that you pay attention when you're administering it, even though there, I've had this happen personally. I sent a horse off to training for a while and I gave, I gave her one dose of the strangles vaccine before she got there and sent the second dose with her. So they would booster it while she's there. Um, and strangles really five years and under is the most effective grade, grade or effective age group to use it on. So she was a younger horse and she was there and they actually administered it. They pulled it up with the needle. They didn't even pay attention to the uh, little nasal syringe, the plastic part, and they injected it into her neck. Oh no. Bad, right? She had a huge reaction like a huge swelling, it was the size of a football. And it was so bad, they actually had to lance it open. She couldn't turn her neck, she had a hard time eating. And like to this day, oh, the, the infection there and the swelling and the reaction was so bad, it caused it muscular atrophy. Mm. So she has a little dip and a scar from loss of muscle from such an inflammatory response. So pay attention, what kind of vaccine you bought. Read, read the label, right? Yeah. No matter how many you've given or what you've done, read that label, right? And they've, they've done it for years. They're professionals right. in the industry and they called and they were mortified. They were like, I am so sorry. Please don't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Whoa, that would, uh, that'd be a bad day. <laughs> yeah. So side note. Yeah, no, that's good to know because I, 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 that is not in my world. Vaccinations you give in the muscle. That's what we've always done. That's what I'm used to. I, now that you mention, I, I have heard of nasal ones, but I've just never been around them. So it's good to know. So you got a list here of common types of vaccines. What what is that? And I'm trying not like I like again, I'm I'm not exactly I am not a vaccine specialist, right? But some of the common types of vaccines that you'll see that you can purchase or use on horses, um, an inactivated vaccine modified live and recombinant. So when we look kind of at the deck, they kind of self-explain what they are. So in inactivated is a killed form, smaller killed form of the pathogen. And the purpose is that it's injected into the animal and we stimulate our immune response again. But it's not a live, live pathogen that's being injected, right? It's not living, it's killed, it's dead, but the body can still respond to that. Yep. Okay. And then the opposite would be the modified live. So that's going to be a modified live virus, right? But their, their decrease rate, right? their pathogenicity has been reduced. So they're not quite as toxic or I'm not sure the best way to describe that one. Um, they're less likely to cause disease, like a full-blown disease, just enough to boost an immune response. Introduce that foreign body, that pathogen to the horse and then have an immune response to it. So it's present, but it just won't make a, basically make the animal sick. Yep. Maybe a low grade. Low grade. Okay. They're dull. They don't feel good. Sometimes when we give our horses their boosters or like us ourselves, every time I get the annual flu shot, I feel kind of crummy for a couple of days. <laughs> our horses can feel a little down and dumpy a couple of days after their booster. Gotcha. And I notice that in all my animals, right? You may be your cats, your dogs. God, when you vaccinate them, that next kind of 24 hour to 48 hour window, they're just kind of the steam's taken out of them. They're just kind of not there. So probably timing of those vaccinations to what you're going to be doing with that horse, right? So don't vaccinate them in the morning and then go ride 30 miles today kind of idea or 20 miles. So 
Yep, and the same with, I always think that with my flu shot, I plan it on a Friday. So if I feel crummy, I have it on the weekend and I'm not missing work. <laughs> oh, there you go. Can go home and lay low. Good. So what's a recombinant then? And they're genetically altered would probably be the easiest way to say that. Um, there's three different ways they kind of have recombinant. So they're going to have a change in, oh, the live attenuated vector vaccines. Um, they're going to put them into some type of harmless virus or bacteria. And a chimeric vaccine, that's substituting some genes from that pathogen for a similar gene in a safe but closely related organism. And then our last one, the DNA vaccines that have a DNA plasmid. Okay, interesting. I've heard, I, I've heard of recombinant, but I've never like really explored what that really meant. So, no, great. This can kind of help, you know, step by maybe understand COVID a little bit more too. Again, I haven't gone and done a literature review. I know COVID's a, a mRNA or RNA based, DNA based, RNA based vaccine for the Pfizer and Moderna, but Johnson and Johnson's um, not. It's I don't know which one category they fall into. Yeah, I don't know either. I haven't kept up on that. So great. So you said your I think your next slide is injection sites. Then, yep. So these are non-nasal injection sites. Yes, not. <laughs> I can pick that out. <laughs> Some of the most common spot we give a intramuscular injection, um, which is typically all of our vaccines, is going to be in the neck. And this was, oh, extension, horsesextension.org has a lot of great resources. And I kind of got the pictures off of there. They put some tape on the horse to show the triangle on the horse's neck. You would give that injection within the triangle. Right? Gotcha. To miss the primary veins and arteries down here in the neck. If you're given IV, you know, you'd come down here in this area and chances are most a veterinarian is gonna be given IV in injections and not our everyday person. Um, coming back to intramuscular here in the neck, it's a big muscle, there's a lot of space and they do move their head and neck a lot so that if there is some discomfort, they, they do use it, they do move it to help decrease the inflammation Basically, a site where that muscle is going to be worked a lot will help dissipate that vaccine into the muscle and work it in, but also get that soreness wore away or anything that way. The swelling is that would that be a fair statement? Yep, and that's that's why I try to get my vaccines in my right arm because I'm right-handed. <laughs> so that I keep using yep. it. Yeah. Well, and I was saying I got my first COVID vaccine this morning and I have a one-year-old, so I'm always holding her in the left so I can do everything. With your right. With my right, you know, so I made sure I didn't get in the left arm so I can still hold her. <laughs> <laughs> some, of, some of the other areas that are commonly given um, some shots, and if you are not comfortable with giving injections, work with your veterinarian, right? It, or if you have a horse that you know has a reaction all the time, I would definitely seek out a veterinarian to help you, whether they have a, a big inflammatory response at the site, I would be happy to hand that duty off to a veterinarian. Um, it's, so it's, again, most commonly we give it in the neck. You can also give it in the buttocks here on the horse. I don't see it all that common done there. It is also another large muscle, but Maybe you guys can tell me why some people don't want to give the shot back here. Uh, I don't want to be kicked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all, all I could think of. Yep. And I, and I, I put a watch out kicking zone, especially in a horse that does not like to get vaccines. Or I think that would be your general. horse, Jeremiah. Yeah. I've not <laughs> tried that in before. Maybe she would be better with it. <laughs> and, it's if really you, hard to, if they're jumping around and moving to try to get an injection here in the correct muscle without putting yourself in the kicking zone I put here. Cause you kind of got to lean around and, and look to see if you get the needle in the right spot. Okay. Well, you could, you could sneak up on her Jeremiah that way, I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> 
I would definitely probably get a kick then. <laughs> a little sleight of hand. Look that way. Not right. <laughs> Not that good. <laughs> but I've never heard of the the pectoral muscle. That's that's crazy in the chest. I've it makes sense. There's that's a big muscle as well, but I just have not heard of that one. Yeah, it's less common. Uh, there, it is a good site for drainage. It drains very well there. Um, with the buttocks, again, our foals, we can give, they have more muscle as I kind of thought about with my daughters. They give children, you know, shots in their legs when they're smaller still. A foal can have, will have more muscle in their buttocks than in the neck. And we can somewhat restrain them a little bit better with a friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a little easier. Or two. But when we look at the pectorals again, that's kind of another hard spot because you have to really lean over. They're going to have to have a horse that stands pretty well for their shots. You're going to be leaning over, looking in the front, and you could be run over. Yep. Or be struck at. Yep. Uh, so you had mentioned if you don't feel comfortable or, or just hesitant about doing shots, it's great to go to a vet. I, I was just wondering, is giving shots to a horse, is there a training that should go in? I'm thinking like with young horses, foals, things like that, or a horse that has, uh, is afraid, uh, doesn't like shots, or maybe was at the vet for an injury and got a lot of shots and got pretty shots shy, if you will. Um, is there a training method or, or is it just the horse is good at it or they're not? There's a couple tips they'll give you. And, and unfortunately we don't have, I always think of like the beef, right? The BQA, how they have a training that everybody would go through. We, we don't have that with horses. Um, there's a couple tips with giving them that you can pinch the skin oh, kind of close to the injection site as a distraction. They are a very small gauge. And a lot of the times the pressure from your pinching the skin or, or even a deep pinch to maybe get some muscle in there a little bit too, um, that's going to distract them enough to not really feel that small needle. And a lot of it is you. If you walk up to the horse, and this is interesting, they have research that shows that horses I forget how many human emotions they read. Mm. And they have actually published research that they can read your emotions. So in most horse people have experienced, like if you're getting mad or having a bad day, like chances are the horse picks up on that. Or if you have a new novice rider that's really nervous, timid, timid and scared, the horse picks up on it. How they respond to it is kind of according to their disposition. They might take advantage of that person or on the opposite. Right. So know. if you're scared or nervous to be given the shot, it's going to respond in the horse basically and maybe make that more challenging to do. Yep. So I like the pinch method. Uh, some people will do a tap, tap, poke. I've actually seen not so good results with that because the horse is like, oh, because how often do you actually tap your horse like that? Yep. Only if you're going to give them a shot. So they're like, oh, it's coming. Here it comes. <laughs> right. And so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you have to use a twitch, potentially, with the horse, like a, a nose twitch. Um, you can grab the shoulder and turn for a, a shoulder twitch, too. But again, if you are really uncomfortable with it, get some help. Have a veterinarian help you. Help you. And they may need some chemical treatment if it really is a dangerous situation for handler and horse both. Great. We have a, a comment from Facebook. Cindy says our local vet demonstrated pectoral injections for our 4-H club. Uh, mm -hmm. There's more muscle, less reaction for a startled horse, right? Um, that was the vet's preferred site anyway in that situation. Thank you, Cindy. That, yeah, it, people have their preferences, right? And just what you're used to and what the horse is in, in essence used to as well. And that makes perfect sense if you've been given it in the neck every single time and they are anticipating it, then you can try a different area and they're not going to anticipate it. Right. They don't expect a shot in the chest. Yeah, the, huh? Maybe I should try the butt. We'll have to see what that means. <laughs> I actually saw somebody give, they gave a really large injection, long story short, it was penicillin. And a large injection, a lot of fluid. And they did give it in the buttock for the reason of the movement of the legs to help kind of dissipate that in that large injection into a large muscle. And how did the horse react? Just fine. 
<laughs> I think he probably would have had a bigger reaction given a shot in the neck because they yeah. need to feed him more in the neck. We don't typically give him in the buttock that much. And that horse probably penicillin. We don't give all that often. And that's a whole nother. But yeah, it's a large injection. So giving it in the buttock was good for that horse. So what else should we consider, Jenny? So I kind of have a slide here just talking a little bit about horses that need, horses should be treated different according to kind of what they're doing. And I've, I've had students a lot, well, my horse never leaves the ranch. Why, why would I vaccinate him? Again, the core vaccines are, are administered and applied and re recommended by veterinarians, AAEP, because we can't really control the, our pest, right? I think of mosquitoes all the time or biting flies. And no matter vectors, how- Vectors, right? You know, the vectors of that disease. We don't have control of that. It's not your horse that's the concern. It's uh, in terms of transmitting the disease always. Yep. And I think about, we have a lot of cattle in the state, right? Between the cattle and the horses and the vectors of our insects, diseases can travel far or fast. So I kind of put, typically again, our general horse population are spring boosters. Again, give them the booster in the spring if they've already had the two dose series earlier in life. Typically we do give our foals it depends on your vaccine. There's gonna be a little variation on what age you should give it to them. Um, typically they're gonna give them, um, and recommendations by AAEP is four to six months for the first dose, and then four to six weeks after their second dose. Gotcha. They do receive some immunity, right, um, from colostrum, from the brood mare. Because when foals, passive immunity is the only immunity they get. When they hit the ground, they have no immune system. The only way that they get an immune system is by ingesting uh, immunoglobulins, right, IgGs from colostrum. So is that why they recommend that you vaccinate your brood mares 30 days before foaling? Is, is some of that immune, uh, immune protection transferred onto the, the fetus and then the foal once it's birthed? Not through the placenta, only okay. through the colostrum. Okay, so through the milk. It, so once that foal hits the ground, it's in the milk and can be passed that way. Yep. Okay. So, in, and they see you kind of about four to six months for adequate protection for our foals through the milk. So that's why they have four to six months start boostering the foals or start giving them their, their vaccines to booster their immune system to continue their protection. Great. So one thing, and on this classification of the horses, you have nothing in here on stallions or gildings, but it, it's a catch-all, right? It doesn't matter the sex of the animal, what their workload is, they should get that core vaccination annually. Yep. And, and I kind of, I left stallions off because there's such variability depending what location they're at. Are they standing at stud at a barn, like um, equine infectious anemia? What, what are the requirements? There's some very venereal diseases, right, within our stallions and mares that we would have specific vaccines for. Um, EHB1, equine herpes virus 1, causes abortion in mares. So we want to be sure that we have specifically vaccinated that brood mare to avoid abortion due to EHB1. And they're going to recommend um, AAEP that we give that EHB1 it's several different months throughout gestation as its own single vaccine. Gotcha. And hmm. virus is a common virus that causes diarrhea in foals. So I put rotavirus on here too, that we're gonna booster that broodmare with a rotavirus vaccine to help pass that immunity to the foal because foal diarrhea comes on quick, comes on fast, and it's really, really hard on the foal. Basically dehydrates them, right? Yep, dehydration. Gotcha. Scalding, it, it, it scalds their skin. It, uh, the, it's so acidic that it mm. will burn the hair off and then they can even get like bright red scalding on their buttocks from the diarrhea. Oh, wow, crazy. It's really hard for them to ingest enough milk 
in fluids in general to keep up with the virus or like specifically diarrhea from rotavirus too. There's other causes of diarrhea in foals. This is one that we can vaccinate against. So just another good reason to be working with your local vet of what is my regimen, right? If I have brood mares in my foaling and just touch and base with them, if that, that's changed over the years, right? Even if you've done brood mares before or constantly every year, or even stallions, right? Get in there, talk to them. When is the time, appropriate time to administer? What's their activity level? What are they doing? But all that core level, right? That's what you were saying before. Get your horses vaccinated for that core level. And then if there's any specialized immunizations and get those vaccines on the veterinarian's request, right? Yes, and, and commonly your, oh, I would say a very common practice would be a five-way vaccine. And I'm sitting here thinking it would be Eastern and Western encephalomyelitis, um, rhinopneumonitis, influenza, and tetanus. Those ones are commonly. And then you'll have a couple other ones. They even have a Venezuelan strain of this encephalitis. And then West Nile virus, right? So that would be your seven way then? Yeah. And, and it kind of, there's going to be some variation. Like there's Fluvac Innovator 6, Fluvac Innovator 5. Um, that just happens to be one brand that I'm familiar with. I don't want to push really one brand or the other. And work with your veterinarian, especially with our brood mares, if there's a certain vaccine that they like better with brood mares or geldings or stallions or foals. Great. Well, what else? What other final thoughts or considerations do we need to give for our vaccination? Kind of my... My last one, work with a veterinarian. Like if we're not that familiar with our area, should we like strangles went through Laramie here about three years ago, super, and it was so contagious. And if we think about this with strangles itself, and I mean, there's many other respiratory diseases that can spread this fast. There's a lot of students here that are at boarding facilities and it started with one horse that shared a trailer and went to Hanson Teaching Arena here in town. Right? And there's 30 other horses at practice. So there's four horses that shared a trailer and they all came from four different boarding facilities. And the one sick horse got all of them sick and they took it home, right? Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with horses being at Hanson Arena, wherever they went home to, right? They were potentially exposed. Not all of them got sick, but it was very prevalent here in this area. So. And it's going to be here for a while in the soil. It's hard to get rid of once you get it. Right. Well, and ironically, this morning, uh, I, so my office is at the fairgrounds here in Park County, and we had an individual pull in and, and wanted to jump some horses out and put them in the stalls and use the stalls here at the fairgrounds because their trailer blew a tire. And so they got to get that fixed before they can continue on. And so, I mean, it's, I guess my point with that, nothing negative against those folks. They're, they're taking care of their animals. But that travel season for animals, competitions, that it's all starting to get ratcheted up as the weather gets warmer and nicer. We're going to start traveling a lot more, uh, maybe see outside states moving to us because our weather is conducive. Is, is that a fair statement? Things pick up in the spring. We all start riding more spring, right? It's always ironic here. <laughs> We're getting the snow you guys snow. only have two seasons there in Laramie. It's only winter and summer. You don't have a spring. Come no. on. No. <laughs> I always think of like the peonies and lilacs bloom in June. It's, yeah. it's winter and short season in Laramie. Short season. There you go. <laughs> so working with your veterinarian to help you decide what is the best coverage for your horse. If you're hauling them a lot, if it's a brood mare or if you have a brood mirror, they're going to require certain vaccines according to your breeding contract before they arrive on place, right? So working with your veterinarian and knowing like one shot is not always adequate coverage for our animals, right? With our foals, if they've, they haven't had the vaccine yet, and this depends on your vaccine, right? You need to do a booster series. So if you don't know the history of the horse, it's always better safe than sorry and give them a two-dose series. Hmm. So if I am traveling with my horses, may I be going on trail rides or, or maybe I'm going to other states for trail rides or, or 
you know, maybe I'm in that performance. Maybe I'm in rodeo or maybe I'm just going to horse clinicians, right? If I'm traveling, is there something that I can do? Granted, I've done my vaccinations. I've followed those recommendations of my vet. I, I'm up to, up to date on that. I'm keeping my records with me as I'm traveling. But is there something else I need to think of as I'm taking that horse with me? Uh, as I'm traveling, I'm thinking, do I need to take special equipment, my own water buckets, my own, does that help mitigate some of that transfer of disease like you were talking about with that horse with the stranglers? The best thing is prevention. The best care is preventative care and preventative care with our, our vaccines as we've talked about and trying to limit your interactions. That's not always possible, right? But limit your interactions when you can. And if you do take them somewhere, I always think it's ironic. Oh, it used to be at this fairgrounds I'd go to, they just have a great big bucket right underneath the spigot, right? So they'd fill that full of water and people would just walk their horses by and they'd all drink out of it instead of filling their own bucket and taking it back to the trailer for their horse, right? So trying to not share equipment, buckets, you know, there's only so much you can do, right, in a competition scenario when you have to get close to another horse or multiple horses are up tied to the fence and they're gonna all be rubbing their nose on it, right? But doing our best for biosecurity and cleaning things up. And when I when I travel with my horse, I, I don't look for the stall that's the closest to X, Y, or Z, I look for the stall that's empty, that has no shavings in it, that nobody's been in. <laughs> for a while at least, right? Yeah. Yep, I can't guarantee it, you know, but yeah. I've done my job in doing preventative care with vaccines and trying to pick a stall where somebody hasn't been. So Jeremiah, as a preventative measure for the individual that was traveling and dropped their horses off uh, or wanted to drop their horses off while they were repairing their trailer, uh, is it allowable to ask for uh, injection records or medical records or, I mean, just, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think it's 100% appropriate and very common at least. And, and you're going to find some places that don't and others. I think, I don't know specifically for our fairgrounds. That's our fairgrounds crew and that. It's, I, I'm not involved in that necessarily. Sure. I just know we have the uh, facilities available. Uh, but I do know for stable especially private stables it's a it's a pretty big deal and a lot of times you have to uh, contact ahead of time and show your records ahead of time kind of thing or at least have them with you once you show up but they'll tell you we you need to have these vaccinations to be on our our facilities and that sure. so i think that's common and i think the records are crucial always have a copy with them another common a requirement to maybe go compete in an event or board your horse somewhere it would be a vet check before attending some type of an event. A lot of them require uh, a vet check and that vet hopefully, right, they can't guarantee your vaccine record unless you are a client there, right, um, but a vet check, they, they at least can look at the horse and, and stop that horse from traveling if they have discharge or a fever or whatever obvious signs that the horse is not well. Yeah. Jenny, if you're traveling a certain circuit, maybe the rodeo or a cutting circuit or raining or whatever it is, is there somewhere that you can look to see if they're having outbreaks in a certain state, a certain area in the state, a certain event session, right? To say, oh, uh, they have this event happen and they're having this issue. Is there anywhere I can look for that kind of information before I travel or consider traveling? Yeah, and I'm, I'm sitting here trying to remember the name of the website. There's a government website that's tracking disease, um, infectious diseases, or I'm trying to think of, I'd have to, maybe I can get back to you and put that, we can post that. You can, oh, especially equine herpes virus, um, EHV, there's several strains, one for, and a relatively newer, very contagious fatal one is EHM, equine herpes myeloencephalitis. Mm. It's a mutated form of that, but it's very contagious and it's a neurological form and it's a mutation, right? So they don't actually have a vaccine for it, but that is one of the diseases they're tracking. Like I know in Spain, they're having a pretty big outbreak right now and they've had a lot of fatalities from it. 
Oh, I'd have to think. It was in Utah. They had a big cutting show. They had to close it down. That was years ago. More recently, we've seen it on the race tracks because of congregated horses, right? Right. On race tracks, they'll have to shut an area down for a while and monitor the horses for EHB. Great. Yeah, if you could find that website, we'll, and you can get it to Jenny Thompson, and we'll post it up on the website with this recording, and then people can find that link easily. And yeah, that'd be fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. This has been another great session. Really appreciate it. Um, Want to reach out and say thank you to all our participants for joining. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this. Um, and just as you know, if, if you followed us before or seen this before, we record these. We post them back up on Barnyards and Backyards Live website. Also, the future shows are listed on there as well. So if you are interested in see what we have for the remaining part of this spring, get on there and, and follow that along. We also put up the any resources, just like the website we were just talking about. And we'll post that up there as well. So it's hopefully a one-stop shop for you. Also take your time on that website. There is a, a button on the side that says a treasure trove of information or something along that lines. And there is just a lot of information there. And I believe we have a, a, a link there that's specifically for horses. So take a look at that. Also, uh, if you have questions, if you want to connect with us with UW Extension, we have an extension office in every county of the state and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. So reach out to your extension, local extension educators and, and ask them your questions. May it not be a, specifically about horses or maybe it's other topics that we've covered. Uh, we're here to help you and try and connect you with the resources and knowledge that you're looking for. So reach out to those folks. And then the last thing, we do this program for you and we want your feedback. And so Jenny has always beat me to the punch and thrown the link for the evaluation into the chat box and also into the comments for the Facebook Live. So please take a few minutes, click on that. We do watch it, we do read it, uh, and we try and address it. Even if it's about rockets in space, we do try and handle yes, that as we can. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, thank you so much for joining us on this Friday morning. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back on another show. Um, with that, have a good weekend. Thanks Thank a lot. you, Jenny. <laughs>